Welcome to everyone tuning in tonight on Zoom and on Facebook. My name is Robin Brown, and I'm tonight's host for Off the Hill, Rabble.ca's political panel. I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Off the Hill addresses current issues of national significance from a progressive and critical viewpoint. And I'm glad to be here with our panelists tonight for a special federal election discussion with uh, some great guests. We have Chuka Ijekum. Uh, hey, Chuka. Chuka is a political researcher and writer and works in the labor movement in British Columbia. Uh, also joining us is Rachel Snow. Hello, Rachel. Rachel is uh, uh, Iahe Nakoda. She holds a Juris Doctor from the College of Law, University of Saskatchewan, and is an outspoken educator, speaker, writer, and co-contact person for the Indigenous Activist Networks. Uh, Rachel resides on our ancestral lands in Minitsni, which is west of Calgary, Alberta. So welcome, Rachel. Uh, we also have Diana Yoon joining us actually for our panel for the first time. Welcome, Diana. Diana is a climate and housing justice activist and community organizer based in Toronto. Uh, she works as the climate specialist at Toronto Environmental Alliance while pursuing her master's. Dana ran in the 2019 federal election as an NDP candidate in Spadina Fork, York, and sits as an Ontario rep for the NDP Federal Council. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, is uh, Libby Davies, uh, uh, who's normally my co-host, a former NDP in MP and long-serving House leader, is moving out of host mode this evening and joining us as a guest. Um, our regular panelists, Leah Gazan and Paul Taylor, are busy running in this election. And uh, so, you know, good luck to them. And our politics writer, Carl Nuremberg, uh, is catching the last days of summer, which I'm sure we all love to be doing. So thank you to all our guests. And uh, let's get right into it. Um, for those of you watching on Zoom, you can participate in the chat or ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And we'll do our best to address uh, your questions. For those of you watching on Facebook, welcome. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. So uh, here we are, the low ebb of summer, devastating fires burning in BC and Ontario, uh, the smoke from which is felt in many parts of the country. We are in a climate emergency, the, the beginning of the fourth wave of the COVID pandemic, and we have a governing party seized with gaining majority when parliament was functioning quite well in a minority situation. Uh, Chuka, let's start off with you. Do you think these optics will influence the mood and intentions of voters? Thank you, Robin. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is likely that whether it's the climate crisis, the, the crisis of imperialism, the crises of the harms of the evidence of ongoing genocide, um, I think it's likely that people will identify these and respond to them, maybe if not um, um, explicitly. However, I think a concern there is that people may their response to those crises doesn't necessarily motivate their vote in a in a in a different way, or certainly not in a unidirectional way. For example, someone could argue that uh, given the crises, it is uh, absolutely imperative that we vote in as progressive a government as possible, and therefore uh, should should support the NDP or even parties further to the left. By the same token, someone could, based on the same evidence, argue that given the scale of the crises, it's absolutely imperative that we do not have a conservative government and therefore must devote all of our support toward the liberals. Uh, unfortunately, the first past the post system doesn't really allow for uh, more intentional voting, I suppose. It's, it's regardless of the, the pressures, the calculations remain the same. Yeah, yeah. And, and Diana, we're, we're in the second week now of a five-week campaign, or do you think voters are seeing this election as a, as a power grip? It's wild to say we're in week two of five weeks, but, you know, I do think voters are already a little bit, like, tired of the election. But, you know, in a more serious note, I do think it is frustrating to have an election at this time. You know, I think that this kind of late summer, people are, you know, maybe 
at, you know, in any election, no one is paying that much attention at the beginning in the first few weeks. But, you know, that start of September is a stressful time for many folks, you know, for children, parents, families, and students, the start of school this year is, you know, more stressful than a typical September return to school, return to campuses. Like, you know, I think there are still a lot of uncertainties and cautions about, you know, what is going to happen, how people are feeling in terms of this, you know, fourth wave that we're kind of in the beginning of. And so, you know, I think those are the things that people are genuinely concerned about right now. And the liberals really need to make the case that, you know, this election, you know, as we've heard them say in the first week or so, that, you know, this is about seeking a new mandate and a really important kind of turning point. But I don't know if voters believe that, you know, I think that that's part of, you know, what I'd hope to get into the issues today. What are kind of those polarizing issues? What are the things that, you know, we are really going to want to see in a post pandemic recovery that like voters will feel like, you know, they have the confidence to maintain the status quo or vote in a new government? Um, actually, on that note, in terms of what people are talking about, uh, let's go to, to, to Rachel. Rachel, at the beginning of the summer, all of Canada seemed to be talking about the need to address the legacy of residential schools. What would you like to see in this election that addresses substantive and sincere commitments to reconciliation? Thank you, Robin, for that, uh, for the introduction and for the acknowledgement of the Anishinaabe and Algonquin uh, territory that you're on. I think that... Uh, Yes, for I think uh, this year, the beginning of summer that saw the finding of 215 children in a mass grave in Kamloops, I think that was a horrific event. And uh, we're still feeling in the Indigenous communities, we're still feeling the trauma, we're still feeling the grief, and we're still feeling uh, the sense of like, uh, sort of uh, not wanting to uh, deal with anything that the Canadian government is saying to us right now. Because if we have been talking about um, hundreds of years or at least um, over at least a hundred years of our people facing genocidal conditions, and we have the proof in front of us just before this election is called, it seems to me like, um, you know, Canada is more willing to put some money towards, um, more looking at uh, the radar or the equipment, the technology to find the bodies, but we're not looking at for the reasons why the bodies are there. We're not looking for the reasons why there were grave sites beside the residential schools. We're not looking at the amounts of evidence that may not be accessible to our people in order for us to have any kind of justice or any kind of uh, closure on this issue. And I think I, I've said this uh, many times that I don't think we can have reconciliation because reconciliation involves understanding our people. And to this point, the Trudeau government, uh, the Liberal government, any of the Canadian governments and even the provincial governments have not fully understood our people. So if you don't understand our people, our ways, our worldviews, our languages, our, our mindset and our, um, the traumas and things that we're facing in our communities, then you, we cannot be, begin to have reconciliation. And one of the things I said today was that I, I live on my reserve in Morley. I live in Minnie Morley, Alberta, but I had to actually come to Calgary because I don't have high speed internet. And so I don't know that Canadians or everyday people know about some of the hardships that we face on reserve because they don't understand. They think it's just easy voting online or doing whatever you have to do. That may not be the truth for Indigenous people. So before we can have reconciliation, we need to have a fuller understanding of who Indigenous, who the First Nation people are, who the Métis are, who the Inuit are. I don't want to say Indigenous and Pan approach this. We are distinct, uh, we are distinct nations with specificity in our approaches, in our languages, and in our territories. So that has to be fleshed out more into the Canadian public so that they understand who we are. Thank you for that, Rachel. And, and just to, to uh, the answers have been great so far. I just want to let folks know. Remember, we our panel's a little longer this uh, time, so you can uh, you can uh, you can you can take a little bit more time if you want in your answers. It's great, but I want to move on 
to uh, the next question. I'm going to start with Libby, but actually I'd like to open it up maybe to everybody. So Libby, you, you know how minority parliaments work. You were the NDP House leader and the first woman to significantly hold that role. Uh, how well has this minority parliament been functioning since the last election in October 2019? Did we need this election? <laughs> well, <laughs> We absolutely didn't need the election, Robin, and I think all of us have expressed that in one way or another just today. And if you look at the polling that's going on, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't put a lot of stock in polls, you know, they are what they are, but it, it seems to be a very strong feeling still going into that Canadians by a very high percentage voters are questioning why the heck are we in this election, you know, um, given where we are in a pandemic, given all of these critical issues like a climate emergency, um, truth and reconciliation, uh, the pandemic, um, you know, why, why are we doing this? And I, I just want to pick up on where Rachel left off because I think there is a disconnect and, you know, elections are very much class issues right? People who are very affluent, who are privileged, who have good resources around them, to them, an election is just like, yeah, okay, you know, I got to vote, I do my thing, I'm registered, no big deal, I know what I'm going to do, I know what my class interest is, etc. But for a lot of people, there's a huge disconnect between the survival of their daily life and the reality of the political arena. And I think that makes it really hard. And so it really brings into very sharp question, um, particularly today, given uh, where we are um, historically, culturally, environmentally, about why the heck we're in this election. And the fact is, and I, you know, yeah, the election's happening. Some people might say, well, what's the point of saying this? Well, the point of saying it is that we have to understand the political arena. We, if we're gonna engage, we've got to understand what, what these powerful elites are doing and why they're doing it. And, and there's no question to me that, first of all, the parliament was working. I was in three minority parliaments, some of them quite tenuous. This one was actually working quite well. And in fact, Carl Nirenberg, who usually would be on this panel um, and is just like, you know, full of wisdom about what happens on Parliament Hill, he just wrote a column where he pointed out um, very well that um, that the last parliament was actually working pretty good. The, the Liberals were able to get through all of the legislation. In fact, it, it was improved vastly in terms of the pandemic response because of the push from the NDP and making things better, whether it was uh, uh, um, income support around COVID, whether it was support for small business, for students, um, you know, like these are all big issues in the parliament. So, the, you know, let's, let's be clear, Justin Trudeau pulled the plug because he believes very opportunistically that now is the time for him to gain a majority. And this becomes a very interesting question too, because then it, it makes us begin to think, well, if he thinks he can get a majority because of just the convergence of these different forces, is that a good thing for the public interest? And, and again, to come back to Carl, um, he, he wrote a, a very good article saying that, you know, a, a liberal majority is not necessarily a good thing. You know, it actually takes us way more back to the center. A, a, a good parliament is where there's a pressure cooker. A good parliament is where there's pressure coming from the left uh, to do things uh, better. I mean, it's not radical. It's not like earth shattering, but it's, a, you know, better than what it would have been when they have these huge majorities. And we only have to go back to the pre 10 years when he did have majority to see how far the liberals at that time and their austerity programs moved to the center right because they could do whatever the heck they wanted right so i do think it it's incumbent upon us robin to to reflect on these things even though yeah they did it he called an election we have no control over it unfortunately but it, it should be part of the discourse it should be part of how can we then do voter engagement how can we break through the legitimate cynicism and disconnect that people feel and say, you know what, we gotta, we gotta take this thing that's happening and make it work as best as we can to, for the best possible outcome. So I think that's why this question and this discussion are, are important uh, as you've kicked it off today. You know, thanks, Libby. 
If I can add to that, I think, you know, Libby, you bring up really important points around, you know, what voters should expect in terms of what we would get with a majority government. I think that kind of accountability is hard enough than any sort of government. And, you know, I think voters should be rightfully frustrated at the choices that they're going to make and the decisions and the the narrative and the framework and the messaging that they're going to hear from the liberals about, you know, this again, this is like a choice for putting us on the path of recovery. It's us or the conservatives, right? We're going to hear the same strategic voting narrative. And, you know, we can dive more into that potentially later. But you know, I, I think voters should be frustrated at that. I think voters should be frustrated right now. Like, you know, what I spoke to, like at this time where the pandemic isn't over, it's not over for many people, many uh, communities, and, and especially, you know, with how much Canadians pay attention to the state of things in the U.S., you know, we are seeing, um, you know, increases in hospitalizations again um, with, you know, the Delta variant. So, you know, I think those are things that... W- you know, people should be asking their liberal candidates at the door, why are we having this election right now? And can you justify that it is not just because it's like a gamble because, you know, the Green Party had a heck of a summer where they are, you know, struggling with many kind of internal uh, challenges. And, and also, you know, I think they're betting on the fact that Aaron O'Toole, the conservative leader, is fairly new and that Jigme, you know, may rise a bit in the pools, but, you know, they really are banking on the fact that this is their best shot at a majority. I do want to get into some more specific issues, but first, Rachel or Chuka, do you want to chime in on this issue of how well the the problem has been working and do we need this election? Um, I'll I'll just say quickly that uh, it seems that there are at the very least three reasons to be concerned about an election occurring right now. Um, one being, I think, as both uh, Libby and Diana mentioned, that minority governments may, in certain circumstances, produce better policy. But of course, that's uh, they are antithetical to the interests of political parties, which, uh, you know, the the concerns about how the interests of political parties negatively impact the public interest is obviously uh, uh, those are long held and and sort of well supported. Um, secondly, I think that uh, there was uh, recent polling, and again, I, you know, as Libby Stewie mentioned, you know, polls are as they are, snapshots from a moment, they don't tell the entire story, but there's a uh, polling that I came across recently that showed that I believe the majority of Canadians, maybe uh, more than 60%, hoped for a majority government simply so that there wouldn't be another election again for a while. So that's <laughs> completely separated from political outcomes. That's just wanting to sort of be uh, left alone. <laughs> and then finally, I think that especially given the escalating crises, escalating multitudinous crises that we face, the more people see political activity without there being corresponding political change, the more disengaged they will become with the political process overall, especially young people. And I think if that happens, then um, our fortunes are uh, slimmer than, than even they are at present. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, Rachel. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to say, I think uh, I actually was not uh, displeased uh, with the situation that was happening with the minority government, because I think um, for us, in uh, for Indigenous people who have the true governance system of this land, we believe in consensus and we believe in that the power should be spread out. So if you have a minority government in Parliament where they're having to uh, sort of uh, piggyback or work with the NDP, that's two different uh, idea, uh, two different ideologies kind of coming together. And they're doing things uh, probably, and you know, they may even have to at points work with uh, the other political parties. And to me, uh, what it means is that the power is not centralized in one group and it's not groupthink. So that, that's more akin or more closer to how we thought in terms of consensus. So when I saw the last election, what I thought was just that it's uh, it's starting to be that it's it's um, it's going into like a horizontal line now instead of being a hierarchy. And I think that's that's very closer to what uh, Indigenous people feel is that the power is more spread out so that uh, everybody feels that they have a, a real part to play and that they are contributing in that area. So then it becomes all instead of a few or just one faction or the elite serving uh, corporate interests. 
uh, that's more, it's more in keeping with the way I think. So actually, and I don't vote in the federal election and I know a lot of indigenous people who don't vote because uh, we feel that we are standing above Canada because we have signed treaties with the British crown. So we wait to see what Canada does like our bad little brother and then follow him from there. Thank you, Rachel, thank you all. Um, all right, there obviously are critical issues that must be addressed in this election, like, like all elections, but this one we have the recent UN climate change report that made it clear that we have to act now on the climate emergency and yet we feel, fail to meet climate targets. Uh, we've seen token responses to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. Uh, the government made large commitments, including millions for Black Canadians, for businesses, nonprofits, and other things. So, um, and we're going to go back, uh, reverse the order here. But so, what will happen to all these promises following the election? Let's start actually with Rachel, then we'll go to Diane and Chuka. So, Rachel, what, what impact will the election have on these issues, do you think? Well, I think, uh, like I, um, right now, what happened was uh, that one of the things that was, um, was uh, critical for us was the passing of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We did not, there were many First Nations at the grassroots level who did not agree with this happening because it was pushed forward. Again, this is like a snap election in uh, a very short period of time. This was also a snap uh, legislation put forward in a pandemic time. So from December until basically uh, May, uh, is when the uh, Trudeau government was pushing the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, saying that they're going to meld them with Canadian law and whatever. But it's they're not talking about our laws. They're not talking again about our worldview. They're not talking about Indigenous laws. They're talking about Canadian laws, how they can uh, match Canadian laws with sort of a, a with the with with a very nice document, but which really has you know, Article 46, which, which says it will not, far, uh, will not affect the territorial integrity, integrity of the state. So basically it's all very nice and it sounds beautiful and it's well-written. I think it's even a nice font, but what, at the end of the day, what does it have? What kind of, uh, what kind of, what kind of um, pressure or what kind of substance does it have? And it doesn't have any substance. And a lot of indigenous people, uh, a lot of first nation people a lot of uh, uh, Métis or Inuit people got off on trying to bring this in because we're at different levels. We're at different levels. Like some of the First Nation people have treaties. And so we feel that we are really dealing with the, that we're coming from an international point of view. Some of the Métis people, they, they don't have treaties. So they're willing to take, they're willing to reach out and bring in UNDRIP. The same with the Inuit who had to make treaties or agreements with Nunavut and with Canada. So if you can understand that across the board that all the First Nation people, uh, the Inuit and the Métis are not just all brown people or not just all indigenous, if you understand that there's specificity, if you understand that we each have different languages, different worldviews, different things that we're looking for, then you can start to understand why there's such a problem. And then with once you understand that, then you also st start to look at those deeper things like um, climate that the indigenous people have been looking and watching the animals for a number of years and talking about the climate change. Even the Inuit people are saying that it seems that the sun is moving or when they look, uh, things are not in the same places where they used to be because of the water changing or because of ridges changing. So there's things that are happening um, across Canada that we feel are part of our worldview and part of how we think, but unless the grassroots voice or the true voice of the indigenous people gets up, it's not the co-opted voice who works for uh, the liberal government or any other government organization or uh, Aboriginal organization. We're talking about the lib we're talking about the grassroots or people. When we hear from that voice, that's when we'll start to hear things how to actually make reconciliation happen. Thank you, Rachel. Um, uh, Diana, um, can we expect substantive debate to emerge on these issues? Can we expect and can we expect voters to find a way to engage? 
You know, I think it's unclear what the key election issues will shape up to be right now. But, you know, I do hope that we do see the parties clearly differentiate themselves on the issues that, you know, residents and people do and communities are, um, you know, really concerned about right now. You know, I think there is a bit of like, the air game where people, you know, are going to see parties speaking on, you know, what's top of mind. I think that, you know, I work in the climate sector. I think, you know, in the past several years, we have seen climate change be top of mind for more people increasingly. And I think this year it's going to be, uh, I would hope that it is a pretty significant election issue. You know, I think that we're seeing the wildfires, the extreme heat, flooding, you know, I think as more local impacts happen, you know, we should also be making those impacts on, you know, how uh, climate change is exasperating existing um, vulnerabilities in our cities and in our communities, you know, those who are homeless or underhoused and how are they, you know, more impacted by climate change. Like those are the kind of uh, nuance of, you know, I think like the equity impacts to climate change that I would really want to see from you know, the NDP, the Greens to try to differentiate themselves further from the Liberals. But, you know, I think it's challenging. You know, I think that it is really hard um, and for voters to want to engage. So, you know, it's more than just waiting for the candidate to come to your door. I think there are you know, some of the larger key players that tend to do mass mobilizations around, a, you know, a federal election with climate, what I'm most familiar with, there's 350 Canada, they have a climate emergency voters alliance going where, you know, they have some endorsed candidates, but they also, you know, are really trying to make it not feel so isolating to be like, I'm an individual who cares about climate change, like, how do I know where to vote, but to be more like, you know, how can this be a coalition across the country so that we can up the ambition of all of the parties and their climate policies and to be able to link it to other issues that matter and to also hold the liberals accountable for things like, you know, ending fossil fuel subsidies, which they've promised several times to do and haven't done. And realistically, that's like a very minimal low bar. We should be, you know, significantly further than that if Canada has any hope to, you know, reach our 2030 climate targets. And, you know, I think that's something that, you know, voters need to really think about, you know, if we want to engage on these election issues, I think, you know, you can find local candidates you care about that, you know, are well aligned, or if you feel like there isn't a local candidate, there are groups, you know, like I said, 350 Canada, there's Lead Now has a Courage to Lead campaign. There are, you know, groups, I think someone in the chat mentioned vote housing. So, you know, I think that way of collective action does, I think, make a difference. And I think that's one way to show you know, support for the, you know, policies we see. It's not just about the platforms, the, you know, party leaders and the candidates are going to put forward. It's about, you know, what are some of those specific things that maybe don't get tons of airtime? Like when I was a candidate, you know, I felt like uh, I spoke a lot on transit and it was like climate and transit and those are things. But, you know, I tried to really emphasize like the NDP did have a commitment to free transit for all. It was never talked about nationally, but, you know, I think sometimes local candidates can really push the envelope on being like, you know, these are things we've promised at conventions to our membership. And, you know, and then I think that's something, you know, that we can also feel like as voters, if you don't feel very close to any of the parties, uh, you know, I feel like often and many of my friends feel, you know, further left than the NDP, but that's where we vote because, you know, I think for many of us, there is still enough hope that, you know, some candidates are still looking to push the party further left because, you know, what we're doing and what any of the parties are promising isn't enough. Um, the, so many good points there, but I, I really agree with the one you said about the don't wait for candidates to, to come to your door. Right. So, for example, like here, so the 613819 Black Hub, we're organizing a debate here for um, uh, candidates of all parties to address Black, uh, uh, the issues of concerns to the Black communities. Right? We're not, right? So I definitely would encourage everyone to do that. Uh, Chuka, what uh, needs to be done differently 
to make this election matter. Thank you for for uh, your sharing your experience, Diana, and your your comments, Rachel. Um, and uh, oh, and I should should mention I forgot to mention earlier I'm speaking from the uh, unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh First Nations. Um, I think that uh, something that's an, uh, an issue that sort of we have as as voters or as sort of people as residents of this of this jurisdiction have to uh, deal with is that our I think the political parties generally speaking and the political system itself the election cycles doesn't really have the political or conceptual language to deal with reality as all of us are being forced to confront it. Um, you know, they say if you have, uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, if all you have is neoliberal politics, then everything's a market incentive. And the the regardless of however the, the liberals or the conservatives uh, uh, define or describe crises, the, the solution that they pr uh, propose always involves giving public money to private interests. And that's, I think that that's both sort of fundamentally flawed as an ideology, but also not enough to either address the crises or give people sufficient hope that the governments have a, an, a, a plan for addressing them or even a plan for attempting to. Um, I think that, you know, climate change is, is a, an issue with a time scale of centuries or millennia. And our, you know, four, two to four year election cycles are just not going to encourage or reward politics that deal with that sort of time scale. And understandably, a, a, a political party, even if it elects, even if it's elected to a, 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 a thumping majority, um, it can't, it obviously can't it say with certainty it will govern for the next hundred years. But we as people absolutely need to develop to develop mass politics that take into recognition what will occur. Because if we aren't, for example, developing internal uh, uh, sustaining, enduring capacities to produce and distribute essential resources, medicines, shelter, things like that, then we have, there's very little prospect for even Canada as the, the sort of settled colony with all its, all its uh, hideous Euro-colonial trappings to survive as it exists, let alone something, let alone the possibility of building uh, a, 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 a space to share, a, a community that uh, that cherishes and cares for everyone and all life within it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, as much as much as we can impose that level of uh, uh, scale onto the political conversation, I think is is to the benefit of us, but to literally benefit of of all living creatures on the planet. But um, it's you know the politicians themselves, or the parties themselves, are not going to. Um, eagerly sort of speak in that frame because their own individual power in that frame is necessarily diminished. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Juka. Uh, Libby, um, an issue that will definitely has been mentioned already. What role will strategic voting play? And is it what's good or bad about it? And does it even work? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get to that, um, Robin, because I think that's a very important question, but I just want to kind of weave it back to something that Chuka just said, and that is, you know, the question of what needs to be done differently in this election. And, you know, the reality is, is that every political party creates its own narrative, right? The Liberals, the Conservatives, the NDP, the Green Party, the Bloc Québécois, they all have their narrative of what they want the election to be out. It's, it's called the vote determining question, right? They try and figure out what's the ballot box question. And believe me, they spend a lot of money talking to pundits and researchers and strategists to try and figure out that what that question is. And very often they get it wrong. Um, and so I think what's different about this election what needs to be different because we're in a pandemic. I mean, in, in, in the good old days, if I could say it that way, you could at least go to a, you know, uh, a, a, a raising hell all candidates meeting and heckle and, you know, go up to the candidate and give them hell and say what you think. And, you know, uh, for all its limitations, you could at least do that. Well, there's probably going to be very few meetings in person. A lot of it's going to be virtual. A lot of it's going to be just talking to people on the street at bus stops or in shopping centers or whatever. 
So even that is going to be different. So to me, what it says is that we have to somehow turn it around. We have to make this election about what are the issues that people care about, not what the political parties are telling us should be the ballot box question. And so that means... Um, a very different kind of engagement. And I think Diana, um, you know, started down this path by talking about some of the, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, non-governmental advocacy organizations like Vote Housing, like uh, Lead Now, other groups who are, who are really trying to like organize and mobilize people. And I think this is gonna be a very important question, but I mean, to come back to what Chuka was saying, and Chuka, when we had a conversation the other day, one point that you made that really stuck in my head because I hadn't thought about it, um, and you're very good at making these connections, is that you actually talked about it globally. You talked about how elections can never be the same because you know now we're going to be facing questions of like climate refugees, right? We're going to be, I mean, look at what's going on in Afghanistan. Good. I mean, we, I mean, the whole election could just be about what the hell happened in Afghanistan after 20 years, after billions and billions and billions and trillions of dollars. You know, we, we, we have people, tens of thousands of people trying to get out because they're so fearful of what's going to happen. So, you know, I mean, just just the global framework of what's going on, you know, like can elections even come close to grappling with some of these questions. So, but I'm an optimist, you know, I'm always, I always have um, a sense of, you know, we have to take on what can we do. And so I do think more than ever in this election, we have to try and redefine it about what we think the issues are. And this is where I think groups like Rabble as a, you know, an online progressive media organization is so important because it's not like the mainstream elite media, right? We're not just getting peddled the same stuff. It is, it's coming from the bottom up, right? And that's what it should be. Um, but to get to the question of strategic voting, Robin, like strategic voting has become this obsessive, nutty, crazy, thing that we, you know, it used to only rear its weird head towards the end of an election. Now, almost from day one, we're into strategic voting. And already, you know, I see the liberals who are out there like, oh my God, you know, you, because of the fear of the conservatives, you have to vote liberal, you have no choice, you have no choice. And, and in fact, to come back to Karl Nirenberg, who writes very wisely on these questions, I always remember him saying at a panel in Ottawa a few years ago, you know, at the end of the day, you got to vote for who you believe in. If you vote out of fear, if you vote because you think something might happen, you know, well, first of all, strategic voting can very much backfire. But if you don't, if you don't vote for what you believe in, if you don't actually vote for the candidate that you think is going to really do the job that needs to be done as your representative, then, you know, it becomes really kind of a very strange exercise that we get involved in. And so I am very concerned about strategic voting, Robin, because it, it it's this mindset that takes over for people and they start like looking at the election in a very different way, as opposed to what do I believe in? What do I wanna see happen? And who's gonna deliver that for me in my community, right? Now, you know, I'm not saying that strategy and tactical things aren't a part of that discussion with your neighbors, with your community, but this idea that you take these these sort of big box messages from 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 like you know Mr. Trudeau, for example, and buy it, you know, it, it, it honestly it's BS. And I, I think we've got to just somehow get out of this mythology about um, strategic voting. Um, I did hear a very interesting twist. I got to tell you, we were. We were at a little community market the other day, and and I I you know I can't help it. I talk about politics to everybody, and this this guy who who said to me, Libby, I'm sorry to tell you, I'm a conservative from Burnaby, and I said it's okay, you know I don't mind that you're conservative, and we started chatting away, and this fellow he told me that as a conservative, he's going to vote liberal in his riding. And I said, oh, okay, why is that? And he said, well, because he thinks if the conservatives aren't going to do very well, his best shot is to try and move the liberals to the right. And I thought, well, this is a very interesting twist on strategic voting, because usually it goes the other way around, right? And, and it usually comes from the liberals who basically say, don't vote your, vote your waste of vote 
waste your vote on the NDP. So all of this to say is that I do think we have to kind of deconstruct strategic voting and we have to we have to find a way again to engage people. And Rachel, you know, I, I really hear you when you say that um, you know that people have, uh, particularly in the indigenous community, have turned off voting and and don't think, you know, well, what's the point? You know, I used to represent East Vancouver, and we had a very um, uh, a, a, a strong population in the indigenous community in East Vancouver, and I used to encounter that a lot. But I think, you know, to me, voting voting is just an outcome. You can't say to people, you have to go vote. It's your duty. Voting is an outcome of people feeling engagement. So I think it does go back to your point, Rachel, that unless we can um, relate and understand to what Indigenous, Métis, um, and Inuit communities, what, what the history is, what people are experiencing, unless we can like share that, understand it, and learn from it, then that engagement doesn't happen. And so it's not good enough to just say you have to vote. What, what we have to do is like engage. And to me, you know, if, any, if people take anything away from this discussion today, I'm, I'm hoping it might be that, is that can we find ways to engage with each other across our communities, right? You know, we, 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 we relate in different ways, geographically, um, historically, in terms of racial communities, demographics, but is there a way to reach across and find some commonalities and find that engagement so that we can affect a bigger outcome of what I think does unite us? And that is a public interest against very powerful elites who, who are united in what they're doing. Boy, they understand exactly what they're doing and they do it you know, very well. And so you know, I think we have to find that point of engagement and we, we sometimes don't do it very well. You know, and and so we don't have long in this election. We're already in. Is this week two? Yeah, it's week two. Right. My God, we've got three weeks to go. Whether we like it or not, election day is going to happen. And if we don't vote, I can tell you the people who have power, they will vote and they will determine the outcome. And I don't want to see that happen. I really don't want to see that happen. So we need people to think about strategic voting and deconstruct it and think about what they want to believe in and what they think is right to vote for. And we need to figure out how to engage with each other. Livy, like I agree with you, but I, you know, I respect like Rachel's point around, you know, if the parties aren't promising the, you know, policies they need to enact the like truth and reconciliation calls to action, you know, if they aren't, thinking about, you know, what a true like nation to nation relationship should be like land back. Like, you know, I, I do think it is like really like disheartening to feel yeah. like, you know, these like the system is what we have, you know, and I think that's part of it is like part of a snap election is also, you know, maybe people will pay attention soon, but, you know, it is like, the days and weeks and months we have between election cycles where, you know, we, we have to, you know, I think in some ways, like it's helpful to elect people who like consider themselves like really accountable to social movements because mm -hmm. like it, it can't just be about the election cycle. You know, I've heard a potential candidate like Abby, uh, candidate, NDP candidate, Abby Lewis call himself, you know, a people's accomplice. And, you know, I think he's really trying to put this idea forward that like, you know, the MPs that you vote for should be the ones like, you know, working with you side by side to get these issues, you know, like implemented and like um, addressed, like outside of an election cycle, because, you know, we can we hear so much during an election cycle, but in many ways, it feels like we're hearing the same things this election cycle as we did in 2019. Totally agree with you. To uh, totally agree with you. Yep. Um, no, no, thank you for that. Ra Rachel, did you give your, your view on voting? Did you have some thoughts on strategic voting? Oh, I don't think, uh, I'm not even going to go into strategic voting because I think it's like the, the last, uh, yeah, like the, the last, uh, um, I don't know, it's just like uh, grasping at straws when everything else is over. But I was going to say that uh, talking about uh, for First Nation people, like if you think right now, the uh, campaigns that are happening across Canada now, what party is specifically going from reserve to reserve? 
what party, where, where are you seeing the parties go? The parties are going to, you know, they're going to Calgary, they're in Edmonton, they're, they're conquering Alberta and then the, um, the Maritimes provinces. This is where they are. They're in the major cities in the urban areas. They may, you know, go to the occasional farm or apple, apple, apple farm or some, you know, tree farm somewhere. They might do that, but they're not, uh, there is no one candidate or one party that's specifically just going to the reserves. Aside from, you know, the uh, the wonderful heartfelt pictures by the residential school graves that, uh, you know, I think all the parties will probably engage in that sort of trauma porn, getting that out there. Uh, but I don't see it for my people. I don't see them talking to, coming to a First Nation reserve and having, um, speaking with them. And it is, it will only be if they do come, it would be, you know, in a week or two before the election, where are they for the rest of the four years? Where are they? They're, they're not speaking to our communities. Instead, we get these top-down policies that come from, from Canada or from, come from actually from uh, probably the administrative arm of the federal government. And there are somebody there, pencil pushers, who are just uh, thinking up these things that come down for us. So there's a lot of um, distrust and there's a lot of uh, anger that our people are feeling, especially when uh, we haven't even resolved. There's still people in, in the midst of grief and trauma about uh, the children that were just found. And, and suddenly now we're in the middle of an election, similar to how we had to deal with the UNDRIP situation from December to May. It's like five months, uh, less than five months, like we're getting, the period of time is getting shorter for us to actually try to, to, to come up with some kind of a, um, a plan of attack or some kind of a um, some kind of way that we can unify and get our voices out there. So that's disheartening for one thing. It's just like you know we we can't do the TikTok videos. We don't have access to uh, we don't have access to Wi-Fi, and you know it's going to take 500 years of discontent. It's going to take longer than a minute. So we can't do things like that. And the last thing I wanted to say, kind of like was. You know, I've heard this talk about climate change being um, important and uh, the federal government's coming in. But, you know, in our in our governance systems, there were people who always held on to those areas, whether it was, you know, the traditional people, the medicine people, people who had dreams. There were people who were constantly looking after that area. So that area did not go away. So that I think, you know, instead of looking at a platform of the liberal party that says they're going to do this and the with the climate change they're going to do this over here they're going to i think it should be that climate change should be a priority for everyone and that it should be its own um its own entity and there should be young people involved and that should be in elders involved but there should be something happening now that is apart from you know what the government says it could be i think that kind of check and balance or something like that it would be a different approach to a government, but maybe that's what we need because who says this is the way it's written in stone that, you know, the um, the way the governments are written or the way the governments are coming in right now, who says that's how it has to be? It's not necessarily, it's, you know, that's the um, tradition that came over from England. So like if Canada is its own country, like it says, not a state, then uh, maybe they want to develop something that uh, they actually own. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that, Rachel. Um, uh, in fact, thank you, everybody. This has been an excellent discussion, and uh, you can see we're getting uh, towards the end. So now we have some time for audience questions. Um, first one I, I want to raise... Very quickly, Robin? Uh, actually, Chuka, we actually have to get the audience questions now. All right. So okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but a, a number of folks have raised um, uh, the role of advocacy groups, and we have a question from the audience. What impacts... Or, or, or influence do advocacy groups have on voters? Is it useful to focus on their efforts? Of course, the hub being 613819, the hub being an advocacy group, we're, we're concerned about this. So, um, Chuka, do you want to start in on that one? Um, I'd, I'd probably want to just second to consider it. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, I can, I'll, I'll jump in on it. I mean, I, 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 I do think that. Um, you know, whether you say advocacy groups or sort of groups that are mobilizing, I, I actually think it's very important in this election. And, you know, the only thing I would say is that 
um, because time is so short, the more that groups can kind of cross fertilize with each other, the better, right? It's really easy to kind of stick to your kind of area, right? Whether, you know, it's vote housing or whether it's um, environmental defense or whether it's um, a reconciliation or whether it's um, anti-racist, whatever it might be, uh, you know, feminist issues, LGBTQ issues. And, um, you know, I, I would love to see a leaders debate you know, they have this leaders debate we're going to have. What is it? September the 9th, I think. I, I would love it if there was a leaders debate that was run by, you know, advocacy or third party organizations and not by the media. And so that you could see that kind of cross pollinization from the groups and, you know, you could see the, the issues become more connected. Um, and so, you know, that's not going to happen, I don't think. But maybe there are other ways to do that online. And in fact, I think even partly what we're doing here this evening and this afternoon on this is, is trying to, you know, kind of help that sort of approach and create that space for it to happen. So, you know, don't, and don't let anybody tell you that, you know, um, advocacy and um, getting out there and mobilizing doesn't have an impact. It does. It absolutely does. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's time to rev it up, really. It's time to rev it up, whether it's to your local candidate, whether it's to the, uh, a party overall, whether it's talking to other groups and trying to get sort of a joint effort going. Um, this, this is the time to rev it up. Olivia, um, I think it's funny. Oh, sorry, Chuka, go ahead. Uh, apologies, Dan, I'll be very quick. I was just going to say that I think advocacy um, is especially helpful in politicizing uh, issues that people either have just kind of grown accustomed to or have um, artificially lowered expectations about. Um, yeah. I think that advocacy helps people recognize what they are owed simply uh, by the fact of their existence, what uh, the, the that you know nothing less than than everything necessary for a decent, well lived life is uh, is accessible or is acceptable, sorry. Right on. Diana. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think it's funny, Libby, you mentioned this uh, leaders debate because I did attend a protest last federal election in front of the CBC calling for like a leaders debate specifically on the climate emergency. It didn't happen, mm -hmm. but you know, as a national broadcaster, they could, you know, and I think those are some of the things. And I also want to say, you know, it is important to also recognize like a time and privilege for people who can be part of these advocacy efforts. You know, I think that what I experienced a lot profoundly as a candidate was the day to day experience of listening to folks who, you know, like in the afternoon, childcare was a huge issue. You know, who's at home, like taking care of their their children and their families and, you know, that kind of like lack of affordable childcare was hugely important to like on the ground to people I spoke to every day, but it wasn't a big, you know, picture like national election issue. It might be this election because of, you know, how the pandemic has, I think, really emphasized um, just being, you know, how, how life has changed for lots of folks. But, you know, I think that's some of the things where, you know, I also want to recognize, you know, if you do have the time and privilege to be part of advocacy groups, like also it's important as candidates and as parties to think about who maybe isn't organized and like, you know, in rural communities, you know, dealing with opioid crises, you know, campaigns that happen anytime outside of the election cycle by people who maybe, you know, like get questions about like jurisdiction, you know, and, and so then they don't engage in a federal election, even though potentially it could be really significant. Yep. Uh, thank you all. Uh, one last question from the audience. I think that'll end and it's a pretty good one. It's, um, well, they're all been good, sorry. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you think the liberals really want to do with a majority? Um, why don't we start with Rachel? Uh, so I think uh, for the liberals, it's about, uh, um, it's really that they, they just don't want to play with the, with the other kids in the playground. I think they want to make the rules and they want to have the recognition. I think it's about ego and power and making sure whatever deals are made are going to help them and their people, constituents, players in the long run. I think that's what it's about. And I was, I was writing this thing up when I was thinking about this. I was thinking that liberals, um, they like to say, like with a with anything uh, uh, in the capitalist system that they want to share. They're, they're trying to make sure that everybody has a fair share. 
whereas the conservatives are saying um, they're not going to share. They don't care. They, they're just not sharing. And the NDP always talk about that like, they have a better plan to share. And the Greens are like trying to conserve or looking at what, what they, they at the, in the long run will be sharing too, but they're just basically trying to um, look at that portion and uh, conserve or try to mitigate that. So for, for me again, for as an indigenous person, I think that uh, we are, we're, we, are, we have been sharing. Uh, that's part of the point of uh, where the indigenous people are not happy with, with what's happening. So I think it's, it's time now for uh, them to learn that uh, we have an original governance system here that answers to the climate, that answers to all people, that listens to all voices. We didn't have to be told to have special legislation for elders, LGBTQT people or women or children. We've always done that within our society. And I think that there's some very uh, beautiful things that uh, Canada, like I said, the younger brother can learn from the indigenous people who have had those original governance systems in place since we have been here on Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Um, the let's go again. We're, we're near the end now, so I'm going to ask the last few panelists to, to answer the same question, but give it in a minute, and we'll go. Let's go, Diana, uh, Chuga, and we'll end off with Libby. So, Diana. Um, I I think it's I think really I you know the liberals want a majority, and in a majority, that's you know what they're most focused on is to maintain the things they're doing, you know, they'll make the promises, they'll make this election cycle. I don't know if I have any confidence that, you know, the things they promise in election cycles, like electoral reform, like, you know, more ambitious climate policy, like, you know, ending out fossil fuel subsidies, like, do happen because you know we've seen time and time again these you know these things are said but then the kind of they aren't addressed so i think it's i think that's that's all it really is you know they want a majority for the sake of having a majority they want to stay in power thank you dan uh Chuka. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that uh, presuming that a great number of the voting population is uh, sort of stuck with or committed to the Liberals and the Conservatives, and then the people that go back and forth between those two parties from election to election are uh, largely inscrutable in terms of their political attitudes, or at very least not uniform, uh, then the minority government in which the Liberals are uh, frequently making legislation with the NDP um, provides the NDP evidence, material evidence that they're, you know, better than the Liberals, making the legislation stronger. It also weakens the Liberals argument that the NDP can't actually govern or doesn't actually know how to write legislation. So it seems that they are like covering the one political weakness by pushing the NDP out of uh, any access to, to legislation. Thanks, Jack. And also probably they just want power. And very, very quickly, Robin, uh, I'll just jump in and say, you know, the Liberals want a majority because they don't want to share power. I mean, it, it's just that plain. Uh, and, and if we want to get to a point where what Rachel was talking about, which is how to distribute power, how to have more consensus, then our best hope is a minority parliament. Our best hope is actually to elect as many new Democrats as possible, because that's going to push things more to a progressive outcome, more to the left. I mean, it, I, I'm sorry, I, I, to me, it's just a, a fact. It's not a a political positioning it's just sort of a reality and uh, if we if the liberals have a majority they will become very arrogant they will be very unaccountable and they'll just ram through whatever they want uh, and they will do what they always do which is run from the left and govern from the right and our job is to prevent that from happening so uh, we've got you know we've got uh, three and a half weeks to do it <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody. That's all the time we have for actually for our panel and for the questions today. We received a lot of audience questions, which is great. So thank you very much. We will try and, corp and incorporate them into our next panel, which is after the leaders debate. Um, thank you so much to our panelists, Chuka Jekam, Rachel Snow, Diana Yoon, and, uh, and Libby Davies. Um, before we go, we since we are in election time, we will be back with more election discussion in September. Be sure to sign up to our newsletter at uh, rabble.ca slash alerts to make sure you get the invitation and to follow Rabble's election coverage. And finally, um, thank you to Rabble 
for creating a, a space to host these important discussions. Uh, did you know that Ravel.ca is a registered nonprofit? They were, so they rely on memberships and donations to bring you events and coverage, coverage like this. And they are holding a summer fundraiser right now. So help Ravel out by becoming a monthly donor at Ravel.ca slash donate. That's Ravel.ca slash donate. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Robin. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Everybody, bye. Thank you.